I'm Dr. Peter Cash, and this is my hobby. I'm Kit Whitaker, and you're watching Chow Line. And are we going to cook in the garbage cans, or are we going to clean in the garbage cans? You cook in the stove, clean in the garbage cans. Important That's lesson tip, number one. Important tip, lesson number one. Headed out to the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when I was working on the book Chow Line because I found out how important trains were during the World War II. Also, they had some great reenactors there during a World War II Remembrance Day, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk with some of the living historians that brought the past back to Chattanooga. Hey, I'm with uh, Pete Cash from Memphis, Tennessee. He is a World War II Korean and Vietnam uh, Correct. reenactor. Correct. And uh, you know I'm going to love this. He reenacts in the sense of a cook and baker. He is a living historian for cooks and bakers for World War II Korea and Vietnam. Pete, great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Can you tell me a little bit about your setup right here? Well, what I've got is a basic field kitchen. I'm set up to cook for up to 50 people at this point. I can do, uh, we can pretty much serve a full meal. We can serve coffee. Uh, I can do breakfast. I can fix supper. I can do pretty much anything from chip beef on toast to pot roast. So how many people have you actually, you actually cook at reenactments? Yes. Okay. Not, not at everything I go to, but I, I do cook at, at several reenactments a year. So and this is all the World War II, 40s era. Um, yes. Does this change much when you go to the Vietnam and the Korean era? Very little. Very the, little. The burner in the stove changes, a little bit changes about the stove, but there's plenty of photographic evidence of World War II era equipment still being used in Vietnam, as late as, at least as late as 1969. There's a lot of stories in my book, Chow Line, too, about some of the soldiers complaining that they're still getting some of the canned food from those areas, too, <laughs> so I think it all goes hand in hand. My name is Louis Farnell. I'm the director of the Southeast Veterans Museum. And we're here today with a D-Day commemoration and, and also sort of a World War II remembrance at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. This is the first year for the event, but we're figuring that it'll become an annual one because it, uh, it seems to be very successful so far. About how many uh, reenactors are here today? I'd say we've got somewhere around 10 to 15 reenactors walking the grounds and set up with displays. And then we've also got vehicle, uh, vehicle owners here as well. So we have everything from World War II Jeeps up to Vietnam Army mules. Trains proved, of course, of tremendous value, both home and abroad. Abroad, of course, the main thing they did was carry the very needed supplies as our army kept moving. And at home, of course, they carried largely troop administration, which said, is this trip necessary? Which was to make civilians think about whether or not they really needed to buy a ticket and go somewhere on the train because they took the place needed by a soldier. We were dropping supplies into the POW camps while we were having to go up there anyhow, and those guys were starving. You could count their ribs in the rib cage from three or 4,000 feet. They stood out so much. And so we dropped those supplies in there, and uh, they were, you think they weren't glad to see them. Yeah. Same thing you use in a warehouse, a yeah. pallet. Oh. Yeah, and uh, they were put on a pallet and strapped down and tied down, then a chute was put on the pallet. It was a very rare occasion. There was less than 21 hours, and most of the time it was between 21 and 24 hours for a round trip. And so we would normally eat just before we left, and of course as quick as we could when we got back, but uh, uh, you weren't going to get fat on it, that was for sure. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Before we go, i got to ask you a simple question. Who makes the better SOS, the uh, blank blank on a shingle, the blank on a shingle? <laughs> the uh, Army or the Marines? Depends on how you like it. Uh, the Army recipe calls for dried chip beef. Uh -huh. uh, the Marine Corps and the Navy recipe usually uses ground beef. Uh, the secret that I picked up, uh, reading some information put out by, by an Army cook in Vietnam, Worcestershire sauce. Worc uh. Uh, kind of adds a little adds a little, a little taste to it. It's yeah. very subtle, uh, and it's not bad. Veterans who come up and see me fixing it, they they all recognize it. It brings back <laughs> memories. <laughs> how many times? How many different ways have you heard it called? A SOS or a chip beef or what's the politest way you've ever heard it? Creamed beef on toast. Creamed beef. Oh, that's got a, kind of a very elegant sound to it. Creamed <laughs> beef on toast. Hey, Kent Whitaker, author of Chowline. Appreciate you watching this today, and I tell you what, it's been great hanging out with the living historians here at Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. 
They represent the men that went out and fought across the world, put their lives on the line. Many of them gave their lives, but they represent the greatest generation, as they're called. But it took more than just those guys at the front. It took the cooks and bakers and the uh, officers, the, uh, the mess sergeants, everybody behind them to make sure that they had the chow that they needed, the strength to fight. But it also took a guy like me washing dishes. So am I doing a good job, Lewis? Am I doing a good job, Pete? Let's talk more scrub. More, more scrub, right. More scrubbing. You missed a spot oh, right there. Yes, sir. Got you, sir. Somebody has to do it.